So we're going to get started here in about five minutes. We're going to give some extra time to some of the people that are coming from the garden sale and also the construction that's on 340 has been slowing a lot of people down today. So we're just going to give we're going to give some uh, an extra few minutes for those who haven't arrived yet.
All right, welcome everybody. Thank you all for coming out. My name is Nathan Stalvey, the director of the Clark County Historical Association. And again, thank you for coming to what I think you'll find to be a very fascinating talk, a talk done by Melanie Garvey and Jean Lee. Melanie Garvey is the archivist at CCHA. She's been here since July of 2019. She has done a fantastic job in our archives, uh, reorganizing, discovering items, doing tons of research requests. She is really taking our archives to another level, and she's done a fantastic job, and some of the work that you're going to see here today Actually, all of the work that you're going to see here today derives from some of the research she's found in our archives at CCHA. Jean Lee is a volunteer with us at CCHA and helped assist Melanie in the archives. She's been assisting there for about the past couple of years. Jean is uh, born and raised in Millwood and has an interest in all things Millwood. So she is, if, you, if you're talking about Millwood, you can't uh, leave Jean Lee out of it for sure. <laughs> So anyway, we want to thank everybody for coming out, and especially want to thank the Barnes of Rose Hill for having us out here for this talk. Thank you so much for all the help you've done, for all the setup, uh, allowing us to use the space here. Um, we really appreciate everything the Barnes of Rose Hill does. So I will now turn it over to Taylor Kumis, our education coordinator, to introduce you to the talk. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Taylor Comis. I am the Susan McCowan Education Coordinator here. Um, a couple things I wanted to go over before we start the program. So this is just a quick reminder that we're going to cover some pretty rough tof topics. The parts of Dora's life um, that we're going to be able to track are marked by very low lows. These events shaped Dora into the person she was, and while we do not and will never know the full story, it deserves to be told as accurately and respectfully as possible. And we've chosen the language we will use carefully to reflect this. Also, um, another reminder is all these materials that we're going to be using today will be put on our blog um, that will come out Monday, May 10th. And you can just go to Clark, um, well, if I can find my piece of paper, clarkarchives.weebly.com. Um, questions can be asked throughout the talk. Um, they do not have to be, you do not have to hold your questions until the end of the talk. You are more than welcome to ask them during. We actually encourage it. Um, these ladies have put a lot into this program, so if you could please silence your cell phones, that would be great. Um, and thank you all for coming out, and we hope you enjoy. Can you see me? Don't put it all the way down. <laughs> well, I'll stand over here. Did I close, did I shut it down? I can close it now? <laughs> all right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, this is, this is uh, difficult with the lights and the, the microphone, because I'm a more casual person in my old age. So bear with me. Um, so anyway, about two years ago, I started volunteering at um, the museum or at the Clark County Historical Association. And I started working in the archives with Melanie. And I just hearing when you arrived, I, sh I arrived shortly thereafter. Um, but one of my tasks, is to go through the files, the, uh, the collections, as you would, and sort of sort things out. We're doing some reorganization. So that's been primarily what I've been working on. And while doing that, <coughs> I was working in a, a, a lawyer's uh, collection. His name was Charles Braun. He was a lawyer in Berryville for a lot back in this day. And I opened up one of the file folders, and there were a group of letters, about 16, 17 letters. And they were all addressed to a person by the name of Dora Jackson. And they were written to, uh, the addresses were uh, Winchester, Front Royal, and Philadelphia. 
We're like, hmm. And they were all postmarked from Millwood. Well, hello, Millwood. I must know this person, even, <laughs> even though it was 1912. Uh, I'm not quite that old, but <clears throat> anyway, I, came, I became very fascinated with the writers. So I opened up the letters and I started reading. And when I did, I became very fascinated with the writer. His name was Israel Jackson. He was writing to his wife, Dora Jackson. Dora Jackson. And she was the silent one in this, this, this exchange because we have no letters from her whatsoever. We, have, we don't know what she wrote back except by w reading what Israel wrote. He might say, I, got, I received your letter. And he might you know, re make some references to some, at some point when they were together. So they had a, what we would call today a long distance marriage. Um, because as I said, she was in Winchester or Front Royal or Philadelphia. Um, so Melanie, in her wisdom, <laughs> decided that she was working on some other letters and we were making them a part of a permanent collection. So she said, aha, we'll do that with these letters as well. So what did that involve? That involved me, the volunteer, <laughs> transcribing all of those letters. And um, so as I you know, really honed in on each word, each and every word, then I began to, it, you know, things became clearer to me that this was an interesting situation that was going on. Um, and it intensified her interest. And I would, sometimes I would read them out loud to everybody in the office, like, listen to this. And I would read, you know, what, what Israel was saying. Because he was talking about Millwood. He was talking about places in Millwood, things that he was doing, the camp meetings, the the dances up at um, Paltan and, you know, different people in the county, which made it people that I recognized the names of, even though I didn't know them personally, I recognized their names. So we became very interested because who were, who were these people? Who, who are Dora and Israel Jackson? Do, is there anybody living here now that um, is related to them? And why is he always telling her to be good? Uh, he was constantly telling her, you know, you don't want to go out with those front royal boys because they're not, you know, you don't want to go out with them and stay away from those guys in Winchester uh, and you need to come on back to Millwood. So he was constantly telling her that and I, M Melanie might uh, say this, but he used a lot of deers when he really wanted to enforce what he was saying, I think, and have her understand, he would call her dear. So in some letters, there might be like 30 dears, like dear, don't do that, and dear, you know, you need, and I love you, and I'm your husband, and so uh, we became very curious about who Dora and Israel were. Uh, we gleaned a little bit of information from the letters, from Israel's letters, but most of what we put together came through the census records, for example, uh, from other legal documents and from court records. Uh, but there's still a lot that we do not know about Dora. And working together uh, on this research, we decided, and I think Melanie had already had this kind of decision that Everyday people needed to be need to be held up in Clark County. We need to talk about the everyday people who have, in some cases, unforgettable stories. And we often don't hear those stories here in this county because there is a preponderance of important people who have money, who have wealth, who have large estates. And we focus very often on those. And so in our in our uh, archives, that's who you're basically going to find, and that's not unusual, uh, you know, across, I'm sure, the country to have it that way. But we feel it's important to recognize and honor the stories of people that, for example, who, who cooked the food, who mended the fences, who exercised the horses, who watched over the children and made sure that they were ready to go to school, who went off to work, 
to offices and factories and came home and um, played with their children who enjoyed the, the time off that they had would be around holiday times, Christmas and Thanksgiving, and always those were important values and, and times of activities for them. Uh, they were the bedrock of the community, and they are the bedrock of the community, and the soul, if you will. They earned a living by working hard each day, and for the most part, they lived in the moment, always attempting to make the best of whatever they had. And you can think about uh, one, of the, one of the things we learned in the letters was that Dora was making $4 a week working when she was in Philadelphia. She was making $4 a week. And out of that $4, she had to pay for the room that she was staying in and purchase the food. So we can figure out uh, what's possible, what's possible for this person. Uh, so we began our exploration with Israel and Dora, two people who grew up in Millwood in the early 1900s with all of its variances of culture and class. They are African American, but theirs is a unique story with a variety of life situations affecting them as they lived their lives. They made some bad decisions and they made some good decisions, but for the most part, they were both trying their best to control their own destiny. And there, if there's anything that we want you to take away from this is that they were acting to try to control their own destiny. And we have to remember, this is early 1900s and what the life and the culture and the society were like at that time. We cannot assure you that all the information that you're going to hear is absolutely accurate because again, you have to put it in the context of the time and the place that they were living. So 16 letters tucked away in a file box discovered by chance takes us on a journey with a young girl whose husband faithfully wrote to her. Telling their story is not meant to cast aspersion on anyone or any group of people, but simply to use the tools that we have to look deeper, to uncover their lives and look deeper, because through that discovery, we learn. So now I'm going to turn over this microphone that I've enjoyed very much. Uh, <laughs> and she's going to lead us through the life or the part of Dora that we know. And uh, because she did leave us with an unforgettable story. And maybe uh, we, we've, we're focusing on Dora this time, but Israel also was an interesting character. So we might be back telling you about Israel. Thank you. All right, so give me a second so we can get the PowerPoint set up real quick. Awesome. I did pay a second. All right, so Jean and I are super excited to finally bring Dora to the public. Um, and if you remember, about a year ago, I actually did a program with the George Tyler Moore Center for the Study of the Civil War um, through Shepherd University. And we talked about these letters. And this was pretty soon after we had transcribed them and we had figured out kind of what was going on. We didn't know very much at all. Um, and it was very much a, an exploratory program. And I'm pretty excited that almost one year later, we have the full story, or as much as we're gonna know for now, and we get to expand upon the information that we knew beforehand. Um, and don't let Jean fool you, she was a very big force behind this project. It was not just me. Um, but anyway. So in 1964, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote a long note in the margins of his personal copy of Charles Silberman's book, A Crisis in Black and White. And he wrote, quote, the South deluded itself with the illusion 
that the Negro was happy in his place. The North deluded itself with the illusion that it had freed the Negro. The Emancipation Proclamation delu uh, freed the slave, a legal entity, but it failed to free the Negro, a person. And the world that Dr. King existed in and the world that Dora existed in were in many ways very similar. Although he was born 34 years later, um, Southern racism, prejudice, and injustice were known to them both. Dora was that quote Negro that Dr. King wrote about, legally free, yet socially stuck, doubly damned by her sex and her skin, in a world where outward appearances were everything and economic stability made you or broke you, Dora didn't have many options. But Dora's story is one of strength and of courage. She took what life handed to her, but she also resisted. She fought back, and she had a voice. She refused to fit within the mold society made for her, choosing instead to carve her own path and be her own woman. And this is the Dora that deserves remembrance. And what we know about Dora, as Jean mentioned earlier, comes from only a handful of sources. Marriage certificates, census records, a few letters, and two very traumatic encounters with the justice system. Hardly any of the information within these documents is consistent. Yet thanks to the clues and tidbits discovered in the course of this research over two years now, we're able to piece together a small inkling of who Dora was. But the picture that we've discovered and the story we've uncovered, it's not happy. It was not a happy story. It's filled with challenge, with disappointment, intrigue, and mystery. Every question we answered along the way uncovered scores more. To the point where we are, like I said, two years into this research and we still really don't know Dora. We don't know much about her at all. On the face of it, this makes sense. She's poor, she's female, and she's black in an era categorized by the absolute lowest point for black civil rights in this country. Yet it's frustrating. In a county where that historically put so much emphasis on rich white landowners, evidence of the other is really hard to find. And, all right, I'm gonna read some of this to you, so I know it's a little bit blurry, but um, just wanted the visual there. On July 1st, 1908, the unthinkable happened. Under completely unknown circumstances, Dora was raped by a man nearly twice her age. She was 13 years old. The rape of a young black girl by a black man drew little attention outside of the black community. Hers was the first of three cases that appeared in the Courier that year. And while it's typical to see the attacker named, especially in a paper so quick to highlight black crime of any sort, the reporting of her case is particular. She is explicitly named as the victim. Eight days after the incident, Will Williams is named as her attacker of Dora Jackson, a quote, 13-year-old colored girl. And what's also interesting about the level of reporting on this case is that it doesn't just talk about Dora herself, it talks about everything. We learn who her father was, what her name was, what her age was, a little bit about their background, where they come from, her attacker's name, and what, a little bit about his background. And this is really the first time where Jean and I found Dora outside of these letters. Um, so <laughs> imagine our shock when this is what we found immediately after all of these letters were transcribed. And this is where the bulk of our information came from. This is kind of what started that research process. All of the other cases from 1908 went to trial. Well, two of them went to trial, including this one here. One of them was dismissed outright. But none of the information from those trials like this was published. We don't know the women's names, we know the men's names, but that's it. We don't know any other information. And all of this begs the question, why? What made Dora stand apart from the other two? Why is any of this covered at all? Why is it covered so thoroughly? And of course, we don't have answers for this, but there's something incredibly remarkable about this event. Dora reports it. 
And this is incredibly hard to read, so for emotionally and uh, visually, but I'm going to read it to you. And sometime after the attack, Dora reports her experience to D.H. Jones, the mayor of Berryville. And this document here is um, the written evidence of her report. So this is the exact paper that was filled out by Jones himself, I think, whoever was um, taking notes or whatever. And it reads, quote, whereas Dora Jackson this day has made complaint and information on oath before me, D.H. Jones, mayor of the town of Berryville, that Will Williams did on July 1st, 1908, in the said town of Berryville, county of Clark, violently and against her will, by force, feloniously did ravish and carnally know her. The said Dora Jackson, she then being an infant under the age of 14, to wit, 13 years of age. And this is still, we've been working with this for two years and it's still incredibly hard to read. Um, and there's only a handful of documents that survive from this case. This is one of them, it's housed in the clerk's office right up the street. But the ones that do survive paint a really grim picture. This report leaves little to the imagination and the language is very specific. Dora was forced. She did not consent. And after her statement was submitted and Will Williams was arrested, Dora was subjected to a medical examination conducted by Dr. Harris here in town. Like modern rape cases, Harris's job was to confirm that Dora's body was violated. His findings were not recorded, but the trial progressed. And we don't know, we don't know what was said during the trial. Will Williams initially pleads guilty, but he later changes his plea to not guilty. There's no recorded depositions, no trial transcripts, and few notes. We know that several influential people stood witness for Dora, but in the end, it made no difference. After what appears to have been an incredibly traumatic and nasty trial, Will Williams was acquitted. The two other cases from that year ended similarly. One of them never made it to trial. The other one was dismissed as well. And we'll never know how this affected Dora. But we do know that she chose to report this, despite the fact that she didn't have the chance of a fair trial. She chose to go to trial. She chose to report this event. And she chose to expose her attacker for what he was. This was not Will Williams' first brush with the law, and it's not the first time he appears in the newspaper for criminal acts, but it is one of the last. This, after this event, um, there might be one more instance, but he really doesn't show up, causing trouble in town again. Today, the reporting of any sexual assault comes with a heavy stigma from multiple angles, but imagine the terror Dora must have felt in 1908 a young black girl in the South with no legal independence from her parents. Yet she was forced to experience the horrors of the adult world. Today we know and expect this type of trauma or this type of predation to come with years of trauma. And we have professionals on hand ready to help. But in 1908, you're just expected to move on. This is, remember, the lowest point for black civil rights, and there wasn't really much resources for Dora. The Latin phrase, Dura lex sed lex, the law is hard, but it is the law, doesn't apply to unjust situations such as this. It's an eat or be eaten world, and she chose to fight back. By reporting this event, she became not just a nameless pass passive victim, but she chose to take control of her story even though she knew it wasn't going to be a good outcome, even though she knew she would be further stigmatized for this action. But, thankfully, her story doesn't end there. On May 2nd, 1915, an article appears in the Times-Dispatch, a Richmond newspaper, um, and it reads, after an investigation lasting since January, four Negroes have been arrested and are in jail at Berryville, charged with poisoning 13 valuable meals old, owned by S.H. Eatson, 
a well-known stockman of Boyce, Clark County. And Sheriff Levi, who conducted the investigation, expects to make other arrests in the next day or two, one of which it is reported may produce a sensation. Those under arrest are Israel Jackson and his wife, Dora Jackson, and John and Worth Jackson, all relatives. 19 mules valued at from $175 to $200 each were received in early January from, a ten from Tennessee by Mr. Eveson, and in a few days, they began to die, 13 expiring before he could get them away. Finally, he got six to his other farm in Loudoun County. Experts of the Bureau of Animal Industry in Washington who examined the dead mules found they died of arsenic of lead poisoning. A quiet investigation has been under progress ever since. And this is just a cool newspaper article. Eatson was incredibly big in the livestock trade here in the area, but he doesn't really show up in county records ever. So he's a bit of a mystery, um, but he was here somehow. Uh, oh, and he had a hotel in Boyce, um, which burns down in 1917. We think there might be a correlation, but we can't prove that yet. Um, so come back in a year, maybe. But this um, article here is the first time that this case is published in a paper, and it's not even a local newspaper. And it's incredibly secret. This trial is carried on very secretly. Um, it's very quiet. And it makes us kind of wonder what's going on. Why is it so quiet? Eason's a pretty big name. He owns a pretty big company. Um, but that doesn't explain what's going on. And at this point, when Jean and I came across the second Dora trial, we really had to get comfortable with, we just don't know. We just don't know what's going on. We don't know what the motivations are. We have no idea. This trial also leaves few records. Um, there's no transcript. There's a deposition that we'll get to but that's kind of it. There's not really a whole lot that we're left with. Just a bunch of newspaper articles and a few summaries in the courthouse. And the one deposition that we do have from this case is kind of where we get most of our information from. And it's a remarkable document in itself. It's the only deposition to survive that we know of. Um, and it's made by a man named Toby Green. And we'll come back to him in a second. But according to Toby, there must have been some kind of argument. He says Dora's actions were about getting even with Mr. Eadson for hitting her, but he doesn't say anything else. Dora goes to some pretty extreme uh, lengths to get even with him, so there must have been something more than just being struck. She points, or she poisons the mules, and if the deposition is accurate, she tries to kill his entire family as well. And that's a pretty extreme answer for something. We just don't know. And she knew at this point, she's about in her early 20s. She knows what's going on. She's not naive. And she knows if she reports this assault, reports Eadson hitting her or whatever happened, she's going to get in trouble for it. She's going to face some sort of charge with Eadson being as powerful and as wealthy as he probably was, it's not really gonna bounce on, or it's not really gonna affect him too much, especially in this time period. So she knew the law is not gonna be on her side. She's not gonna report it. Why, if her earlier attacker gets off scot-free, why is this one any different? And just as remarkable, is how many men she was able to pull into this event as accomplices. And we don't really know why men are drawn to her, but every time she pops up in the letters, in the court case, in the deposition, she has this circle just kind of surrounding her. Toby, Frank, Wash, John, Israel, although Israel's not really an accomplice, um, and all the various people that she interacts with and she comes into contact with, in, in the process of setting up this poisoning. They're all men. None of them are women. And what was it about her that drew, drew people to her? We don't see resistance on their end. Of course, it's not really mentioned. So if there is resistance, it's pretty well hidden. But 
even Toby in his deposition, you don't see him saying, you know, man, I really just wish I hadn't helped her. Man, I really wish, you know, there were a bunch of us, we tried, but we just couldn't get away. That's nowhere. And many of these men who do help end up on trial with her. They're all charged individually. And in the, end of this, in the end of this, after the investigation, Dora is indicted on five felony charges, all of them having variously to do with poisoning, poison the mules, attempted murder on the family. Um, and despite pleading not guilty, she's convicted of three. The rest were waived after she was sentenced to three years hard labor at the Virginia State Penitentiary in Richmond. Frank pleads guilty. He's also sentenced to three years hard labor. And Toby, whose deposition we have, was sentenced to the Negro Reformation Association of Virginia, but we don't think he ever made it there. Almost one year to the day after the sentencing, he's struck by a train outside Berryville, down by the tracks, and he's crushed. He had just turned 17. Many of the details, as I'm sure you've figured out by now, are unknown, we just don't know. But once again, we have a very clear instance of Dora taking matters into her own hands. She chooses not to be a passive victim of an unjust system, even though she knows exactly what's coming. Her sentence is not a surprise. This is the height of Southern convict leasing system and chain gang labor systems. There would have been stories circulating among the black community, circulating among Millwood in the county. She might have been poor, she might have been black, she might have been female, but she wasn't naive. But I did save the best part for last. Not only did Dora mastermind this whole event, she planned to frame her husband, Israel, for everything if she was caught. At least according to Toby, but it's a pretty convincing story. Now, Jean brought it up earlier, and I've mentioned it a few times, but if this is the first time that you learn that she's married, that her husband's name is Israel, you're going to ask yourself, why? Why is it hidden? Does she have a bad relationship? Is she, why is she framing him? What's going on with that? And thanks to an incredible stroke of luck, we can take a pretty detailed look into their marriage. And that luck is those letters that Jean brought up. Between 1912 and 1915, right between both trials, Dora and Israel exchanged letters. Right off the bat, we know they're married. Uh, he's constantly calling her my dear, dearie, my dear wife, etc. And you get the sense that she really needs reminding. His letters are incredibly personal. And unlike, unlike the trial documents, the newspapers, and any other government records, these weren't meant to be seen by outside people. So they give us a really good idea of what their life is like, what their marriage is like. And it's not edited. These letters, they haven't been redacted. We have the originals. Um, this is exactly what Israel is writing to Dora. And of course, as Jean also said, we don't have Dora's response. We only have Israel writing to her. But even still, we can learn a lot of information just from what he's saying and what he's responding to. And the first letter is pretty remarkable, pretty unremarkable, excuse me. It highlights their general domestic situation. Um, you learn their names, you learn kind of where they are, but there's a pretty important clue. Dora's not at home, and she's not living at home with Israel. The letter is addressed to her, but the address, the physical address, is in Winchester, 19 North Washington Street. The house still exists today, and it's the home of her employers, the McCormick sisters. She's working as a domestic servant, and based on the contents of the letter, we can kind of assume that she's living with them. He says he wants her to come back home, he's not happy about her being apart with him, but he's looking forward to the pleasure of walking back home with her. So we can kind of figure out that they're really just not together. And the next letter is even more telling. He says, quote, I received your letter and I'm glad to hear from you and I'm sorry to hear you say that you told a lie. And if so, my dear wife, will you please inform me of it? So not only is she living apart from her husband, which really isn't all that scandalous given the nature of her work, but she's keeping secrets. Now, I know you're gonna, what you're probably thinking, and we were also thinking this at one point, all of these letters are written by Israel. We don't really get Dora's voice. He seems kind of controlling. Maybe something's going on there. Maybe he is controlling. Maybe it's an abusive relationship. 
And I'm gonna say, wait on, hold on a second. We've got more information. There we go. This PowerPoint's a weird format, so I'm sorry if it takes me a couple of seconds to change slides. Um, Dora and Israel got married March 22nd, 1910 in Millwood in the home of Benjamin Layton, who also officiates their wedding. She's 15 years old, and we know this because, as you can see towards the middle on the left-hand side there, her parents have to sign off on the marriage because she's under the age of consent. Israel, who's born in 1883, is pushing 27. This actually, uh, his age is wrong on this one. His birth was recorded, so he's actually born in 83, not 85, I think, is what this wants you to believe. Um, and the age gap's not super unusual. I mean, it's pretty normal. But she is under the age of consent, which raises some eyebrows. We don't know why they got married. We don't know really how they met. They both grew up in Millwood, but that doesn't really explain anything. And this is only two years after she's attacked. So 1908 to 1910 probably not even two full years. Was Israel rescuing her? Was he trying to help her reestablish that respectability after it was forced and taken from her? We don't know. We have no idea. Um, she seems, the letters don't tell us, they don't really give us a clue. But what we do know from these letters is that she seems to like the company of men. As we brought up earlier, they just kind of are drawn to her all over the place. And we, we just don't know why, but she seems to like it. She doesn't really push them away. And the letters make us understand that Israel suspects something's going on. She's jumping from house to house, job to job. She's working in Winchester. She's working in Front Royal. Um, and she's working in Philadelphia, and we have addresses for all of these places. So they're real places. They're not just fictitious, made-up things. Um, and they're pretty far from her home. And they're both from Millwood, like we said, but we're pretty sure they're at least attempting to have a base residence in Boyce. We know Israel is renting some property somewhere in the town. Of course, we don't know. That would be too easy. Um, but they're all pretty far from either Millwood or Boyce. And Israel's staying here. He's working odd jobs in the county. He works for the Gilpins. Um, he's pretty stationary. He doesn't really move around like Dora does. And we can tell from these letters that they're separated for almost the entire duration of the timeline that we have. Sometimes he visits, sometimes she visits, but they're never really together for very long. Um, and at one point, or yeah, at one point, there's a chance she might be pregnant. He's very concerned that this baby might not be mine. Um, and he's always warning her about not to run off, don't go see these people, you know, don't bring other men into the house, etc. And it, it sounds, it still sounds like he's concerned, like he's controlling, like he's trying to be there in spirit, if not in person. But again, this is Dora, so there's another twist in the story. In 1914, an engagement announcement appears in a Philadelphia newspaper and conveniently highlighted is Dora's name. Um, it reads Dora Jackson, 1545 Dorrance Street, and she is engaged to marry Charles Britt, who lives in Philadelphia. Now, we know this is her for two reasons, and the first one is that we have letters addressed to her at this address. We know she's there, we know she's living there. Um, I think we can't quite confirm this yet, but we're pretty sure this is where she's working as a housekeeper. Um, but the other reason we know it's her, we have her marriage certificate. <laughs> it lists her parents, her birth date, all the important information that confirms that it is in fact Dora, um, and she, lies about half of it. I think she lies about her age, but she's very, her parents are listed accurately. Um, most of the other information is pretty accurate, but the fun part is that it says she's never been married before. Now, 
not only is this a blatant lie, but we have both marriage certificates for both Dora, or Charles, her second husband, um, and Israel, her first husband. But if you kind of remember back to the timeline, this is 1914. The poisoning case takes place in 1915, and she is very conveniently listed as Israel's wife. So we're not really sure what's going on there. Um, but in light of the situation, two husbands, one in each state, Israel's letters seem a little less controlling and maybe a little more grounded in reality. But beyond her marital issues, what we can clearly see in these letters, even from Israel's perspective, is that she's, she's a very independent woman. She is her own person. She doesn't let marriage, either one, hold her back. She's not confined by traditional ideas of womanhood. Um, and she's certainly not a passive victim to her own story. She's incredibly mobile, and she rarely has Israel in tow. And while it looks like she's following job prospects, so the house in Winchester, she works for the Adams family in Front Royal, she's a housekeeper in Philadelphia, and again, we know these addresses, so they're not just shots in the dark, they're not lies, they're actual, actual dwellings, and we know that people live there. Um, and we know that she's not sending money home to Israel. Typically, when you see this kind of situation, you kind of want to build that future together. So you're working apart, you're saving money. Um, she's not doing that. We know in the letters that she's buying new clothes, she's buying new shoes, she mysteriously has a gold watch. We're not really sure where that came from, neither is Israel. Um, and you don't see her operating a certain way because Israel wants it. You see her very much kind of ignoring his advice or suggestions, I guess. She's definitely her own woman. She's not held down to anything. And it doesn't even really appear that she takes Charles's last name when they marry. She remains Dora Jackson. And if this is because she doesn't want her Clark County friends and relatives to know she's married again, or no, we don't really know. But there's still probably, or excuse me, Israel and Dora are still probably legally married by this point. Um, the newspaper lists her as his wife. Israel certainly thinks he's still married by this point, so we're not sure what's up with that. But she's acting this way for a reason. She's choosing her actions. It's not just happenstance. And after two years of research, we still don't know very much about Dora. In fact, were it not for those letters, we wouldn't know anything about her at all. She'd just be one more of those nameless figures in history, lost in the pages, overshadowed by the greats. But it's still an ongoing project, halted by COVID, but we're working on it. And we hope to discover more in the future. And one question that is definitely still on our minds that we are trying so hard to get access to. Housed in the Library of Virginia in Richmond are all of the records for the Virginia State Penitentiary. And if Dora made it there, we'll find her file. And we'll figure out what was going on, what her sentence really was. Was she leased out? Was she not? Was she sick? Did she die in prison? When was she let out? And maybe we'll finally get a picture. Now, as an added bonus and a bit of fun after a pretty depressing story, um, these didn't make it into the actual timeline or the actual story we wanted to tell. Choosing which direction to take her life was an incredibly difficult one for this talk. Um, and we wanted to highlight as much of her as we could without really boring you to death. But both hers and Israel's childhood homes still exist. Um, and they're still in Millwood. They're privately owned, so don't go knocking on any doors. But this is Dora's. Um, it's now 69 Cunningham Lane, right there in Millwood. And it was built early 1880s by her dad, Charles Jackson. And this is the house that they lived in. All seven living children kind of grew up in this house. And Charles, her father, lived there until he became too infirm and moved in with his son, who lived in Berryville around the 1920s. 
And this is Israel's home. This was built around the same time frame, probably a little bit earlier, um, but early 1880s. And it's built by actually his dad, Israel, again, and his uncle, George Washington Jackson. They go in on the property together, they build the house, um, and then eventually the property splits up. So this was Israel's um, dad's side of the property. And this is the house. It's abandoned, but still privately owned, and I wouldn't recommend walking inside. Um, but that concludes our story, and we hope you enjoyed it as much as Jean and I did. We're incredibly attached to Dora. <laughs> it's been a wild ride from the start, but um, yeah, at this point, if you have any questions, we're happy to answer them. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, your book named Jackson for Dora's maiden name was Jackson, the married name was Jackson, the little girl was Jackson. Were they related to you draw lines connecting them, and are there any lines since then, any descendants, anyone you know or know that are drawn of, of Jackson, Jackson, Hoover Jackson? Yeah. Who this is a great question. So as far as we can tell, there were about three individual Jackson families in Clark County. None of them seem to be related. Um, so I can confidently say Dora and Israel are not related. They do not come from the same Jackson families. Um, Israel's family was actually free. They were never enslaved, as far as we can tell. Um, and they were living in Winchester for a couple of generations. And Dora's family was enslaved in the county. They were actually owned by the Randolph family. We have direct evidence that her grandfather was their butler, um, Dr. Randolph, and her father worked at Carter Hall post-emancipation. So they are not related. They do have the same name. Moving forward, um, I try not to kind of go too far up because I will just get mired. The family tree that Jean and I have assembled for these two is massive. Um, and it will be, there will be a link up on the blog to it so you can kind of explore and see who's who. Um, but we do know there is a few living relatives of Israel, I think, that we know of still living on one of the divisions of this property. And as embarrassing as it is, the name is escaping me. <laughs> do you remember who it is? Jackson. It is a Jackson. I can't remember for the life of me his first name which is not good. Um, yeah, this one is of the Masons. Yeah. The, the original property was a pretty big, I should have had a map for this, but it's a pretty big triangle. So it's this one, and then if you know where this is in Millwood, it's the house next to it and the house next to it. That's all originally the same property. Three brothers-in-law went in together and then as they kind of established themselves, it divided out. So this one is the Mason's property. One of them, I think it's the next one, is the Jackson property. And he's descended from Israel. Charles Jackson, that's right. It's Charles Jackson, but he's not related to Dora. He's related to Israel. And then we know we traced it. We know that one. Yeah. Um, We have not. So she actually disappears from the record as far as we're able to trace and completely after the trial. We don't know if she ever makes it to the prison that she's sentenced to. We have no idea what happens. Yes, yes. Yeah. 
That's a great question. Um, so we know that her siblings were baptized at Christ Church in Millwood. I think they were baptized in groups. So a couple of them in 1884, a couple of them in 1894. Conveniently, Dor is not listed, and her family stops showing up in the registries after that point. So in the county, we can't find her anywhere. We've searched through the church records that we have access to. Um, I have turned the archive upside down. She's the last. She's the last. Yep. Right. So we do have, um, Jean reminded me, we do have her in two census records. One of them, she's a child. Um, and her name is actually not listed as Dora, it's listed as beautiful. So we think that's her, everything kind of lines up. Her birth isn't recorded in the county. Um, she's actually the last of what we think is 14 pregnancies. So her birth isn't recorded. And there's a couple other of her siblings' births that aren't recorded. Um, yes, yep, her mom had 14 pregnancies. Um, and that's actually pretty consistent. Her mother reports that. Now, whether that's accurate, we don't know. But it is consistently reported as 14 total pregnancies, seven living children. Um, so she is the very, very last of both of those. Um, so we see her in the 1900 census, and then we see her in the 1910 census, which is recorded right after she marries Israel, and then she's gone. She disappears. Yes, ma'am. The dates run between 1912 and 1915. Um, there's a pretty big gap in between some of them. I think we might have one or two letters for the entire year of 1913, but that's, yeah, they're pretty, 1915 seems to be the biggest year, 1912 is pretty big, and then in between we get like a handful. So, Taylor, do we have any online questions? Have you noticed? No? All right. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so honestly, every time we found something, it was pretty big um, because she just doesn't exist in the day-to-day -day records of the county. So we found, I think we found the mule case first, and that was really where we went hold on, what's going on? Because um, we didn't... In Richmond, yep. Yeah, not until the trial actually gets to court is when they start reporting it. So that was pretty exciting. Um, and I think the hardest part for both of us was when we uncovered as much as we did about the rape case, because she's so young, um, I still have an incredibly hard time reading all these documents. As a woman, I'm not that much older than she would have been when we lose track of her, so that was that was pretty hard. But yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yep, we don't have any other letters um, that we know of. Some might exist. They're actually. I want to say there's an Eadson family collection in Tennessee where they're from. Um, and because of COVID, they're all completely volunteer run. So because of COVID, we haven't been able to reach out to them. Um, but they're on the list to see if there's any kind of cross distance connection that we can find. Um, that would be awesome. But he just kind of. Yeah, and we can't find, it goes up in flames, allegedly. I can find one reference for that. Not in the newspaper, it's not, I don't know. Morale, you've told me about it, and then we found something in the archive that mentions it, and that's it. So we kind of, yeah. Yeah, so I actually think it's not our Dora, but 
there's, we, you know, we don't know for sure. But one ledger book that we have from Millwood that still exists, I can't remember whose family it came from, but on the front of it is written Dora in letters that kind of resemble Dora's handwriting. Um, she's literate, that was her writing, her own name. Um, and it's a very brief couple of diary entries from about this time period. And it talks about just kind of her being social in the county. Um, it unfortunately doesn't give us enough information to know if it's her, if it's one of the other Doras. There's a handful maybe in the county during this general time period, but it's a possibility that we're looking forward to. Yeah, so um, sidetrack from that just a little bit. When we decided what angle to take for this talk, we really wanted to highlight Dora's independence. So we kind of steered a little bit away from the letter content and moved towards more of her as a person. Um, but the letters themselves could take another entire lecture. So they, they're so fascinating. They tell us, we learn names of people in the county, we learn when family members die, we learn when um, neighbors in Millwood, there's a tragic incident actually, um, something like an oil can explodes and two little boys are killed. And Israel talks about that in the letter. And he talks about it in a way that suggests familiarity with them. So we kind of get a little bit of an inkling about their place in the county, who they are in relation to everybody else. Um, but about, Dora herself, we kind of just learn that she runs around a lot, he doesn't trust her, and it, it acts like she has disposable income, but you also kind of get the sense that she's irresponsibly spending all of this money. Now, again, we only get that from Israel's perspective. We don't really know what her side of the story is. Yeah. Yeah, there was a looking glass. He was supposed to be bringing her. He didn't. Got mad, I think. Yeah. Yeah, they, oh, go ahead. I noticed that men are attracted to her. Mm-hmm. That's, yeah, that's definitely a possibility. Um, and it's something I wish we had, I hate speculating about this part of her life because anything we say is gonna be wrong and it's, someone's gonna get angry. Um, <laughs> each other or you know anybody, it's just, so t it's just so sensitive. But I think we can definitely, I think that's an option. I think, um, she was shunned. I mean, we can't find her in the county outside of this very small handful of information. And we don't really see her mentioned anywhere. <sighs> Nobody seems to kind of, like we just, it's like she didn't exist. And so the fact that she could have potentially been shunned by that female support group, I think is absolutely something we can speculate on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, 
cousin, yeah. She, her older sister also wasn't recorded her baptism, but she had already been married by this point. So she is the only unmarried child who was not recorded. No, I think it's very much she's just the last of a lot of children. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it, Maybe it was, and the, the paperwork was never filed. Maybe uh, it, the fact that hers isn't recorded doesn't really raise any alarm bells for us. I think knowing what we do about just the family situation, I think she just didn't record it. And so, although she comes back, she just stays at the church and does only Latin work and continues to call it time between 1890 and 1910. If she calls back, if she is hosting church, working on local church locally, then we need to evolve her thinking to American Pennsylvania Philadelphia, who is a working city. So, I guess what I want to know is, you know, more broadly, is this a trick? And two, again, I'm talking about the philosophy here. I mean, what do you think this story tells us? Yeah, so you do see, um, I, haven't, I haven't taken the time to kind of really place her within that exodus. So you do s definitely see a lot of Clark County African American people moving to the outside of Harrisburg, outside of Philadelphia, and you see that kind of throughout the late 1800s, um, which is of course part of that greater exodus north. Um, especially as kind of the reconstruction ends and we're, we're moving out of the south. So you do see that, um, and I think we see some of that even within her own family, some of her earlier siblings. Um, she is the youngest of seven surviving children. So by the time she's born, and, or by the time she's an adult, her older siblings are married, they have their own families. And you do see them push north. Yeah, and you do see them heading into Pennsylvania, um, for the purposes of this, we haven't explored that super thoroughly yet. So that's something that we're hoping to kind of get towards now that we kind of have the initial push out of the way. Um, and so my gut reaction is that I don't know if this is part of that exodus. The sense that you get with the letters and the context that we do know 
is that she has connections in Philadelphia. Now, whether, whether those are, hey, come up here with me after you know I get settled, or those are um, work connections, or you know what have you, we're not sure. but we don't know exactly who she's working for. We have addresses. Um, thanks to COVID, we haven't been able to kind of explore that avenue yet. But we, I almost feel like she's chasing those job opportunities over, over following those general trends. And this is a gut reaction, so don't quote me on this. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's why I guess there's this interesting tension where yeah. it's like the cow belongs to the national aquarium, but then it's a very interesting story about a woman that's into herself who, who's really defining her, her place in, in an incredibly difficult time and an incredibly successful world. Yeah, and I think that's what makes her so fascinating to us is that, you know, aside from the mystery and the intrigue, which is as humans we're drawn to, but she is absolutely defying what's expected. So. She goes north kind of after that initial wave. She doesn't really seem to be following that wave. She gets married again. She's very, she's operating kind of on her own. Um, and I would like to think it's in reaction to some of that pressure, but you know, we'll never know. Um, but to get to your second question, what are we gonna do with this information and how are we gonna kind of use this? I think, and this is my own opinion, this is not Clark County's opinion, um, <laughs> but I want to phrase that. I think we've spent, you know, this county is established in 1836. We're very, very close to the bicentennial. I think we've spent almost 200 years focusing on rich white people. It's time to focus on everybody else. Um, I personally am a historian of class and gender. So Dora's story is fascinating to me because she's not a rich white landowner. She doesn't exist except for a few mentions of her name. Um, and Israel, too, is the same kind of way. And all the people that we've been able to kind of pull out of her story, um, Will Williams, his wife, we know a little bit about that. We know, I mean, her, her siblings, his siblings, their family, it all, the more we dug into this, the bigger the web got. And I think this is a really, powerful moment in both our national history with all the tensions that are going on right now, um, but also within our own institution. This is a really good chance to kind of push the envelope a little bit to really branch out and start adding those people into the story, um, which sounds kind of preachy, but I think it's important for us to acknowledge that, you know, there's more people to the story. Um, I come from a background of extreme poverty, so I think, maybe a little biased, that it's just as important to tell those people and tell those stories. Yes, ma'am. Do you have any idea how many letters Dora Bell has written? <sighs> I was hoping no one would ask this question. We have no clue. So we found them in a collection, uh, or in a pile, really. It wasn't even sorted a box of stuff from Charles Brown, who was a Commonwealth attorney, late 1890s. Um, he was an attorney in Berryville forever. And then he ends up, it's like the mayor of Salem, Virginia, I think. Like really, really way out there, it's bizarre. Um, and we just, we were sorting through it. Jean and I were tackling it finally after it's been sitting in the corner for years. And we, she actually found them. Um, I was doing something else, but she's like, hey, you know, these don't fit. They, like, they don't, what's this folder of letters doing and all of this legal stuff? Um, which is really how we got, you know, we got started, but we don't know where they came from. We don't know.
Yeah, she got them. Yeah, that was our, and then we realized he wasn't the Commonwealth's attorney at that point. He wasn't even in the county at that point. So how they ended up, we just have no clue. I wish I had a better answer than that. But there it is. Anybody else? Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so once again, we don't know. Um, but in 1917, apparently, the Eadson Hotel in Boyce burns down. Um, and I say apparently because I still to this day can't really find a reference to it outside of like one very specific memory. So, um, but apparently it burns down and it's owned by Eadson, the guy who allegedly, or who hit Stora. Um, and it burns down, I can't remember the, the date that we attribute to it at the moment, but it's within the time frame to where maybe that's revenge. No, that's absolutely speculation. Um, and really, until we know more, it burns down and that's all we know. But we know that there was enough animosity from Dora towards Eadson that possibly that's a thing. Um, Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's in the census record for 1900. Um, and the funny thing about census records is we rely on them a lot as historians, especially because, you know, they give us names and dates and family connections, and they're great sources of information. But when you sit down and think about the groups of people who are being interviewed by unknown government officials or unknown people from you know, the county or whatever, um, and considering most of these people are, I don't wanna say pretty poor, but they don't have a lot of money. Um, they're gonna be pretty secretive. Clark County is a very small community. It's a very tight-knit community. And so having you know, this unknown census taker, he's probably not from the county, um, having this unknown census taker kind of ask all these questions. You know, who's, who's in your family? What are their names? What are their ages? When were they born? Uh, where were their parents born? What do they read? Can they write? What's your native language? All these questions where, as a poor person, you, even as a rich person, honestly, you would be a little put off by. So the fact that her name is in there, we think it's Dora, pretty certain it's Dora. The fact that it's in there as a nickname instead of her given name, it's not super uncommon. Um, you see, you see men and women and children and whatever, their names are spelled wrong, they're given wrong, they're reported wrong, they're recorded wrong. Um, you see deliberate, I, I guess deliberate, misleading of information. Um, so it's not, it's not uncommon. Um, we think that was her nickname, just kind of based on, she's about five at this point, so we think that would be her nickname, and maybe that's what she's known by. So depending on who was home, when the census was being taken, and, or when the information was being taken, that's just what they called her. They're, you know, they're used to calling her beautiful, um, or that's what, we, we think she's young enough that her given name is probably less used than her nickname, uh, as you typically are as children. So by the time she shows up in the 1910 census, she's Dora. Um, she's married, she's got a husband, she is Dora Jackson, so we think it's just, She's a young child. One other thing to think about to that with the census records is also that, you know, the census took place in the late fall of 1910. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. people who are pregnant and not intending to give away their babies, they can't call the name Dora Jackson. Exactly, exactly. Mm 
anybody else? Yeah. She was trapped. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wasn't home, right? Yeah, and that's, yeah, that's absolutely something we've kind of speculated on as we went through. Um, not having Dora's voice makes it hard, you know. But yeah, that's absolutely something. Anybody else? Yes? All right. Thank you for coming out. We have thoroughly enjoyed sharing her story. And we hope one day to be able to update people farther with a more complete picture. But thank you, everybody, for coming out.